What's happening, friends? Welcome to another episode of IGN Unfiltered. It is our monthly interview series where I have the great privilege of sitting down with the best, brightest, most interesting minds in the games industry. Uh, Sean Crankle is my guest. He is the co-founder of Night School Studios. And if you're going, I kind of know, that name sounds vaguely familiar. This will do it for you. Oxenfree. That was your breakout game from a few years ago. Just fantastic adventure game. Thank you. Teenagers, adventure. Death, possession, it's, it's all kinds of partying. stuff going on, um, and and you've you've uh, followed that up now with After Party, which is out October 29th. Yes, on pretty away. much every platform. So we'll get to all that, but I always like to start at the beginning. We're gonna we're gonna go back in time. Take me back in your brain. What were some of your favorite games growing up? I want to figure out how we got to where you are. Yeah, let's, let's hop in the way back. back machine. We're gonna go pre Super Nintendo. Good. We're gonna go pre NES. Oh. Okay, I'm you don't look that back. old. You no. don't look that old. I'm older than you think. <laughs> um, we're gonna go wood panel, Atari 2600. Really? We're gonna go probably that bad Spider-Man game. You remember the Spider-Man? No. Game? See, I, NES is my that, is my jumping off point. point. Okay. Yeah, so that's... my dad got us a, an Atari 2600, and all I remember was that. Also, yeah. it was a horrible Pac-Man game. It was like the worst <laughs> port of all time. But Spider-Man, you just had like a single color building, and then you mm -hmm. shot like a massive pixel. Uh, wide uh, uh, web up yeah. the side of the screen, and then you just fell over and over and over again. So that's <laughs> how I fell in love with games. Um, but then, yeah, probably Mario 3. I mean, all of mine are going to sound like everybody else's. Super that's Mario okay, 3 though. is it's, just... It's your story. So great. But then a lot of the, you know, like the LucasArts stuff is, is massive. I was going to ask you about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Day of the Tentacle in particular, although Sam and Max, Maniac Mansion. I played Maniac Mansion on NES. I didn't play it on yeah. PC, yeah. which was just a slog. Have you played that recently? Have you tried uh, it? No, with a, not, with a not in a little while. Yeah, it's brutal. I mean, you can still microwave <laughs> a hamster, but it's it's rough. Uh, but yeah, the the uh, I would say definitely um, you know like like all of those that I mentioned. But my favorite of all time, Link to the Past. I've probably played Link to the Past I don't know thirty times. That's a solid right answer. Through. So good. You've been gaming since you were a kid. Yes. Let's fast forward to you're growing up. You're starting to figure out who Sean is, what yes. Sean's going to be. You worked on a late 90s soap opera te television show called Sunset Beach. Wait, before that. Before others oh, before, before that. that. Okay. I worked at EB Games in the yeah. Lombard Mall across from EGM for like five years. Nice. As a, like a preteen into teenage years. Yeah. I was first job kind of thing? First job kind of mm -hmm. thing. Slinging uh, uh, Donkey Kong Country with a big orange hat on my head. <laughs> um, and then I got an internship out here or out in Los Angeles when I was 19, and that would be for that show. So it was called Sunset Beach. Yeah. Uh, it was this failed Aaron Spelling daytime soap opera. So my my first introduction to LA was like, oh yeah, of course you hang out with like the Spellings and you go to this block long <laughs> mansion and yeah. actually threw up in Aaron Spellings bowling alley Jeez. underground by mistake. This is already off to a horrible well, start. Well, let's press pause for a second. <laughs> how, how do you end up with an internship? So where are you from originally? Is it Chicago? Grove, Illinois. So it's like yeah. 20 minutes outside of Chicago. Okay. Yeah. So how, how do you get from Chicago? Did you want to go out west into the games uh, games or entertainment industry? What's Entertainment for sure. I was yeah. going to school in Chicago at Columbia College for film. Okay. So this was like a writing internship uh, that a friend of the family was actually a writer on this series, Sunset Beach. And she had written on all the, you know, Days of Our Lives, all yeah. these other soap operas. And it was like, will your parents let you go out there and live alone while you're 19? And I made the case everywhere and I got credit from Columbia, talked them nice. into it. Then I dropped out of college. So it didn't matter but <laughs> I, I pushed and pushed and moved out and stayed for those three months and I was like I just need to stay out here and start but, working. I mean that must have been like if that had happened to me at 19 I'd have been freaking out. That would have been the I most awesome thing. Out. Like, what do you mean, what? I get to go out to LA and work on a TV show? It was crazy. Were yeah. you just out yeah. of your mind? Out of my mind, yeah. From there, a friend of mine that had been uh, like the office assistant on that show knew somebody over at D Disney Feature Animation, yeah. and I was like, I'm going to go try and get in there as a PA and make my way in there. So yeah. then took that jump. What was Dang. So was the games <laughs> thing, was that just like always in the back of your head like, man, I'd love to make video games hyper passionate about games yeah. like every aspect of my life was games from like like outside so you know i was a big like pen and paper guy but not on dnd on the ninja turtles rpg instead there was a <laughs> there was a pen and paper oh yeah that pen, sounds pen and awesome ninja turtles thing and it was all like the old comic style so hyper oh, yeah. violent you know they're all tied up with eastman and laird yes. stuff like and there was yeah, crossovers with ninjas and super spies and a few other things and there was just this big crazy 
Yeah, thanks. So, anyways, so, wait, 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 hold on. Do you roll? <laughs> are you playing one of the turtles in this in this you pen and paper, whatever, or, or you, you make want. your own character? You make your own. And I made. Who were you? His name. This is horrible. His name was Nemad, which yeah. was Damien backwards. Yeah. I was thirteen. Don't don't hate. Him. <laughs> he was scaly. He had blades coming out of everything. He yep. was covered in blood. My mom probably should have called the police. What was the mute a mutation of? It was like everything. Everything. It was like when you go to the go to Subway and put all the soda in one cup. Right. I had that mentality. And so you drew them in some like notebook paper. Drew them in notebook oh, paper. Yeah. Rolled a bunch of dice. Yeah. Here we go. That's cool. And then it was like yeah, he would go and you know stop drug deals and in, in uh, warehouses things right. like that, <laughs> as mutants do. So games are always in the back of your head. You're Absolutely. playing games, pen and paper, and video game. It's another one of these things where it was like somebody that I had worked with. At sun, during the Sunset Beach era, she had mentioned to me that uh, she had a friend who was also like a coordinator over at Universal Interactive at yes. the time. So Universal Interactive was this perfect kind of crossover for me because I had the experience of where I had just been the last few years on the film side, and Universal Interactive was on the lot. They, you know, this is when they were still working with Insomniac and working with Naughty Dog. Mark Cerny was like just leaving as the head of Universal Interactive at that time. Yeah. Um, and I interviewed there for like an associate producer gig. And it wasn't even a design thing at all. It was much more on the production right. path. And it just worked. It just happened. So you're, in your, <laughs> in your, you're in your early 20s at this 21 point. 21 so 21. Point. Maybe 22. And so in my notes, it's you ended up heading up a team that was working on a platformer for Universal. Do, is that correct? So that is correct. So um, in the very beginning, I was working on a couple of the Crash spinoffs, and these were the bad Crash spinoffs. You know, the <laughs> moment when Naughty Dog is like, bye, and then it's like, here's a really whack uh, PS2 game or whatever. So I was working on that, doing some design work and working as an associate producer. But Microsoft at that time, this is before the first Way Xbox Way before came Xbox, out, right? yeah. And they were kind of going to publishers and developers and going like, you are great at this, so we want to partner with you on this. So they're going to go to EA to try to get a great sports game. Mm -hmm. They came to us because platformers were still really oh, yeah. a big deal, right? And so um, our whole kind of production crew started to pull together these various pitches. And I, in over the course of a weekend, just go nuts and write this ridiculous pitch about a ferret that has been kidnapped by a torturous kid and he's kept in a cage under a bed and the kid watches all these violent kung fu movies and so yeah. the ferret steals a big pen and some yarn and a paper clip and he breaks out he fights all these cockroaches and then he goes on this animal liberation movement so it's like this like dirty Toy Story type of a <laughs> <Yeah>. platformer <laughs> that had stealth in it and it was called Ferris so I pitched this to Microsoft and they green light it and I'm like, what? Because <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm doing still. Like, I'm just sort of winging it. And we're like, we're going to find a developer to work with on this thing. And so that's essentially what happened. I mean, like, this the, is the age of impossible, right? Yeah. So it's like, I guess, yes. I guess the. That was it. It sounds yes. like it's good to go. Like, all right, green light. Let's do this. It was insane. So we initially, it was with Bizarre Creations. You remember Bizarre? Of course. I yeah. mean, Project Gotham Racing. Incredible. Blur. I mean, what an incredible studio. Yeah. So, so great to work with. Super, super talented. And so this was, I think, right after they did Fur Fighters. So then I work on this game for like a year. They give me a budget. I'm the producer and lead designer on it. I'm spending all this time out in the UK. I'm just a child. <laughs> are, are your parents, like, when you call home to t tell your parents what's going on, like, what, are they, like, just stunned at what you're, like, do they just think that California is this magical place or that you're just this, this, this like, golden, I, like, Midas touch I don't child? Know. Like, I don't know. What, I what don't did your know. parents think? I don't know. Every time I was going back home, though, it was odd. It was very odd <laughs> because I was like, this is working out. And there's yeah. certainly low times, you know, I'm just talking through the highlights, but, yeah. like, that part was crazy because yeah, then I'm, yeah, I'm flying to the UK all the time. So then, I think right around then, so Sly Cooper comes out. A few other games come out that are in that general genre, but like three or four come out that bomb. That I can't remember the names of them, but a few of these big budget platformers come out, and then Universal pulled the plug. Mm -hmm. So that was it. We're like a year in, and I had blown all this money, and the game just sort of died. Oh, then we can go into Fifty Cent. That's yeah, well, I mean that's <laughs> so. You, you worked on the first one, Bulletproof. Yes, yes. Um, just before we, before we get to that, uh, just licensed game because you worked on, mm. and I think, a lot of licensed games over the years. Like 20, probably. That's a lot. Yeah, a ton. Um, it seems like working on a licensed game would be a total nightmare, mm. where you just have fixed budget, fixed time, 
and you better get it done or else. Because most of them over the years, I guess up until recently when people have started to put more money and time into these things, but they, were, they always had the reputation of being kind of just horrible, terrible. <laughs> yes, I mean, they still so, mostly do. Do you know, as you're, as you're a mobile game developer, that you, you just know that you're, you just have to make the best of a tough situation? It's, or do you, do you think like, yeah, this is good. I'm going to make this awesome. This is going to be great. And then it somehow doesn't, it somehow goes horribly awry. Like what's, it's what is the mindset? It's super different every time. Okay. So like all those, um, those logistics you're talking about, about timelines and budgets and all that, those are all awful, uh, certainly. But even on top of that, it's like how much uh, feedback or direct line of communication do you have with the license holder right. is, is critical, right? So like even recently, like we did the Mr. Robot game for like through our studio at night school. Yes. That went great because we worked directly with their whole team and it was very fast and fluid and they trusted us and we trusted them. And like these people who have these licenses or the creators of these shows, they don't want to make something shitty. Like they want to make great stuff, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> so it's about all the layers in between usually. And it's also about how risky do you want to get with it? So in the case of the 50 cent game, that went really awry, like the first one. <laughs> that, so uh, yeah, I got, I got to hear about that. 50 was weird because I was like initially sort of the internal uh, flag waver just behind like let's make a thing like we should yeah. do this um, and Interscope Records was basically part of the big same parent company so mm -hmm. that's why that all started okay. um, and at the time Interscope was like we want to make a game we think that this guy is going to be huge and the more we looked into it, it was like yeah this does I mean he's going to blow up Get Rich or Die Trying hadn't come out yet yep. um, he was you know obviously under the tutelage of Dre and, and Eminem and so then it turned into like okay let's get behind it we actually started making a much bigger game a much bigger game. It was like an open world GTA clone wow. initially with another studio that I don't know if I should mention, but they're Fair a great enough. studio. Yeah. Uh, that got really far along, far enough along, then it got canceled. And then at the last minute, it was like, we still need to make this game for oh. scope. <laughs> so fast forward, 50 Cent Bulletproof is another one of these like 11 month titles, right? I mean, it's like a brutal timeline. So the team there, like I mentioned earlier, when you talk about people that do great work that are working their butts off, like the lead designer went on to do um, uh, Darksiders 1 and 2. Wow. Like most of that team went on to do really incredible things, but just had a lot of challenges thrown at them. We had, so the writer of Bulletproof was Terry Winter, who is the creator of Boardwalk Empire. He wrote wow. Wolf of Wall Street. He was the <laughs> exec producer of Sopranos. It was like that caliber, you know? And then like, I got to direct Dr. Dre. So it was, I liked working on it. The game's not great, but <laughs> it was That's fun to work cool. on. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, so let's fast forward. When and how do you connect with your cousin Adam, who'd, who'd worked at Telltale on, uh, coincidentally, my, probably my two favorite Telltale games, Wolf Among Us and Tales from the Borderlands, uh, and, and decide to start your own independent studio? So we... Uh, we connected when he was born, um, and, that, <laughs> and uh, for years we had wanted to work together. So we actually worked at the same company most of that decade. Like he was at Universal doing QA while I was oh, okay. there. Uh, when I was at Disney Interactive, he was there. So he like had we the were kind of always around. The game around. development bug too. He had the bug as well. Um, and I think that you know, for, up until then, there was just not a natural path to us doing it. We had talked about maybe we write a movie together, maybe we do this, maybe we do that, but. Like digital distribution had not really taken off yet. Unity wasn't really a thing. Mm -hmm. So like there was no way for us to do that. And about, I don't know, maybe I guess this is 2011-ish. Um, I actually went up and interviewed at Telltale to be a creative director there. Didn't get that gig, but we kept, and he was there at the time. Okay. Adam was already there. And at that point, that was the light switch where we were both like, we want to do something special together. Let's figure it out and let's be very aggressive about it. Like now it's time to shit or get off the pot. Yeah. So we spent about six months ideating what we'd want to do. This is while I was still at Disney. He was a telltale. And then I got laid off at Disney. And then that was the perfect like kick to get things rolling basically. Um, Cause I had a two year old daughter and it was like, you know, I, you have, basically five months before you burn through all your savings, right. uh, let's get this thing off the ground. And so we pulled together like a business plan and the general structure of Oxenfree in that period of time. Like I think we talked for a while about going, how do you take Limbo and The Walking Dead and mix them together? That was like the mission that's statement a, that's for That's a killer Oxenfree. elevator pitch right there. <laughs> and that's really what we were pitching. It was like Limbo and The Walking Dead. Like what if you're playing Limbo and you could talk while you're doing it? And then. <laughs> 
that got us this momentum. Did the the idea for Oxen Free sound like did that come right at the studio's onset? Like you you had that going in, like that that was uh, your and uh, and and Adam's idea heading into this whole thing. It was it was, there were two. I'm going to refill you by Please the way. Do. I Let's was, see how I was how... giving the the eye. <laughs> um, Oh, well, good pour. It's a little better. A little better. It's a little better. Um, there we go. That's a great pour. Okay, not bad, it's right? A great pour. I don't do this for a living. Okay, thank you. Let's look at that. <laughs> that's a really good pour. Um, yeah, the we had two ideas that we wanted to somehow merge. One was just a pure design idea, which was like, how can we make story the toy? Yeah. So like, how can if every other studio is going, story is this connective tissue between what the real gameplay is. We were like, how do we just make the gameplay story? And so communication and all of that was like a thing that we wanted to make sure there was no cutscenes. We never took control away from the player, and there was more like an ability for the player. And so. From that, knowing how small we were, we were like, well, let's start to develop ideas for a story that a team this small can make. So a desolate island is a pretty good place for something like that. A small cast is a pretty good place for something like that. Them not having machine guns and rocket launchers is probably <laughs> pretty cost effective for us. Um, and so, on, you know, on the other side of that, like we're just huge fans of like Spielbergian 80s teen preteen stuff. And there, it wasn't overly saturated yet. Like Stranger Things hadn't come out. None of that was really out yet when we started because it was 2014, like mm -hmm. right when we were starting. And so. Those two things just kind of kept feeding each other. It's like the toy is talking, and we want a bunch of teens who are dealing with teen coming of age stuff. Yeah. And, and we kept going, but the, the ghostly nature of it, that came later. Uh, we didn't have that yet. So, at, at what point during the project, I always love asking this question of everybody that's made something cool, where, when, when do you know that you have something special? Is it like on paper up front, like this is going to be great, or is it not until. Gamers are playing it, like, or somewhere in between. I'm always curious. It is a, it is an emotional roller coaster because in the very beginning, you're like, oh, I got something really special here, and then you start to sort of like dig in a bit, and you go, oh, there's a lot of problems under here that we have to solve. That even though we thought we were picking the simplest thing, it's extremely difficult. Yeah. And then you solve a bunch of those problems. You go, oh, this is incredible. And so, like for us. The out, from the outset, we're like a coming of age story where you determine how the player comes of age and you can talk freely the whole time. That, we were like, we're onto something. But about halfway through the game, we're like, this game sucks. <laughs> like, we are, we're dead in the water because none of the performances were in yet. It was way more complicated to make than we expected. Like, there's so much performance in the characters' animations. There's so much in terms of like, how do you. Uh, convey fear and tension when the camera is so far away right. and you don't have the language of film to work with where we're cutting between people and so for a long period it was like I don't know if this is gonna work and then right towards the end we're like okay this feels special so it's it's definitely it's a roller coaster huh. on a sort of the other side of that same coin I'm curious you know is it frustrating at all to try and cut through the noise as mm -hmm. an independent studio, you know, knowing that you have something you feel really good about, to just try and get noticed when there are like 5,000 other great independent titles that are publishing to PC and consoles on an almost literal daily <laughs> basis? Yes, uh, it's terrifying. It continues to get even more terrifying. I think um, one of the things that probably helped from just that stint that I did on the marketing side was understanding at least where to start with an idea that is big and not so esoteric that it's hyper focused on just a particular group of gamers. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a way that we could communicate Oxen Free that would sound very focused, but there's another version where you just go, you know, it's the, it's a playable uh, freaks and geeks and poltergeist mixed together. And how do we communicate the game that way and, and give that promise? And so that's not just like how you message the game, but even like our art style, for example, at that time, Pixel art, I mean, pixel art is still huge, but like at that time it was like the biggest thing from yeah. like 2012 to 2015. And we were like, let's intentionally go left. Even though we love those types of games, we want to look different and make it look like we are, you know, somebody that would be talked about with the other big boys. So right. like, I think Cappy does a great job of that and has always done a great job of that. Like, they are an indie studio that has. Um, that, that is always talked about in sort of the AAA conversation. True. And we we kind of leaned into that, and we continue to try to do that. We move to After Party now. You go from teenagers trying not to die <laughs> to uh, young adults who are dead. <laughs> Unfortunately. So, 
Um, I ask you with all due respect as we <laughs> sit here with beers, did the idea for this game where you're trying to outdrink Satan to escape hell, did it come about while you were sober? No. <laughs> no. Uh, no. <laughs> Neither did the ferret game <laughs> from earlier in our conversation. Um, the, yeah, like, so after party, really where it started was we wanted to try to build a game that was just in a bar. We thought that would be a yeah. fun thing to do, right? Like, I'm the idiot who goes into a Skyrim pub and just hangs out there and drinks and watch, you know, watches the, the, the animation sway <laughs> in Red Dead. And, like, I, I love that, right? And yeah. I was like, nobody is making the most of pubs and bars as a setting. And at that time, I think we were about maybe a year after Papers, Please had come out. And Papers, Please was another thing where we were like, what an efficient, brilliant game because you yeah. can have all of these different walks of life come into a single location and, and have a story come right. out of that, right? Which is very different from what we had done before. And so we were like, well, let's make a bar game. And then in the beginning, it was just like, well, what could you do? Could you be a bartender? And then, as you've seen, pouring beers isn't all that fun. <laughs> so we were like, let's do the drinking in the bars and then that sort of snowballed and the hell you know stuff that came a little bit later <laughs> but ultimately we thought as a studio that wants story to be the core of your interactions drinks could be a really fun way to augment a dialogue system yes. to augment abilities to augment all of this it's like an RPG mechanic basically absolutely it is yeah. so then the, the the funny part, this is very odd. So there's a there's a cemetery called Forest Lawn across from our studio, and it's massive. Anybody that has been to LA, it's like, I don't know, three miles across, literally. And so everybody's buried there, and it's this sprawling, crazy place. And we'll walk over there and brainstorm sometimes. And Adam and I were just walking past some giant uh, crypt, and we're like, wouldn't it be cool if you were dead doing this? We're like, yeah, it's stupid. And then maybe two hours later, we're like, what if you had to outdrink Satan? That's really <laughs> stupid. And then a week later, we're like, no, that's that's pretty cool. Like, we should do this. And then it all just came together after that. We really started working on it. That, that was a little over two years ago. That's so cool. Was there was there ever any thought to trying to maybe continue Oxenfree's story and keep that going? Absolutely. Yeah. And there are still thoughts there about that. There are still that. thoughts. Yes, yes. We know what we would want to do with that if we did that, too. So we're still thinking that through. But, like, I think, you know, with After Party, it is almost like a... It's, it's not a spiritual successor, but you'll see, like, as people play the game, it's not just this, like, surface, ridiculous pub crawl through hell, which right. it is all of that, but <laughs> it's really, like, this exploration of Milo and Lola's friendship and why they died and how they died and uh, teasing out the trauma, but in a fun way. Like, it's it's a comedy, but ultimately, if, when people play this, they're going to go, oh, this is a direct descendant of Oxenfree. Yeah. Uh, so I want to talk about Game Pass for a second. Mm -hmm. So you're on Game Pass now with Oxenfree, yep. and uh, you are launching After Party into Game Pass. As much as you are legally allowed or willing, I'm, I'm genuinely curious, because I actually hear this a lot from, you know, I host our Xbox podcast here every week, and and I, and I there's a lot of fans, gamers, that, that kind of go, hey, how does that work as far as, like, you guys keeping the lights on and being successful. Like, so you are launching a brand new game day one into Xbox Game Pass. How does that work for your studio? So we wouldn't have even done it if Oxenfree didn't do so well via Game Pass. So what happened with Oxenfree was like, we ultimately, Oxenfree had come out via ID at Xbox. We already had a great yep. relationship with them. And prior to Game Pass launching, they were like, we want to flesh out this catalog. Um, there are some terms that I can't talk about Fair specifically, enough. but it's not like they're just like bring it over here for free. So there's, you know, you could imagine that there's a reason why we would do it. And it came out and what I was worried about was, is this going to cannibalize other sales early on? Like that was the main sure. concern, right? You go, well, if this is going to be out on the same platform that it, like, I want people buying it on Xbox still. But what we found was not only when it came out on Xbox or on Game Pass, did it like not do that, it also increased our sales everywhere else, on every platform. Because I think what wow. happened was like the discoverability that you're talking about, yeah. certainly when Game Pass first came out, it had a more limited catalog, but I think 
it's the least friction imaginable for somebody who's looking for a new game. So they right. have heard about Oxenfree, they're like, eh, maybe I don't want to spend the money on it. They try it, they play it, ideally they fall in love with it, they tell their friends about it, and we got a ton more installs across the board everywhere. That's awesome. So it was great. So with After Party, when they reached out to us, they were like, we've had a great partnership with you guys previously. We structured a somewhat similar deal, but ultimately it's the kind of thing where it's weird, I don't, like, nobody, Nobody at Microsoft has told me to say this, but it really is like one of the best things to happen for the game industry. I completely I feel like agree. It's incredible. Yeah, I think we're gonna, in five years. This will be the just the industry norm, norm and yeah. we'll look back on buying games as a as a probably mm -hmm. a weird thing. But so you're getting you're getting a lot more eyes on the game, which will in turn lead to more sales for hopefully after party and probably for oxen free too exactly is that yeah is that yeah. fair and to it's say a, yeah and it's like you know it's it's uh it's something that what what we've found when i was talking before about being overly precious about certain things um the same way that i used to be really paranoid about streamers playing through our game and spoiling it for people now i'm like it just doesn't matter and on the xbox or on the game pass front it's like this is the way to get a ton of eyeballs on this thing and ideally loving it and having it be a part of like them caring about our studio moving forward, right? Yeah. Like it meant a lot for us to now you get have a name for them. You get right. fans. Exactly. To look forward to the next thing. Yeah. So oh that's that's awesome. Do you see people that play on Game Pass? Do a lot of them buy the game, even though they already have it on? Do they like go ahead and convert that to full ownership? They so because Game Pass can run out, we've seen a lot of people then they if they don't continue with their subscription, they do that. Or what we found is that they'll end up buying it on other platforms too. Nice, so okay, like yeah. Double, triple dip across yes. the board. Yeah. Oh, that's that's, so that's so been great. really cool. Like that's I think there's something about the size of our game and like just the the genre that makes people sort of feel like I kind of want to own this on two or three yeah. platforms. You want to hang on to it forever. Right, right. And that means you've done something right, if people feel that way. Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> what, do you, what do you hope gamers, again, October 29th? Yes. Game Pass? PS4, Xbox, PS4. PC. And, and what's, uh, if, if, it's, if it's not Game Pass, what's the price? Are we, are we $19.99? $19 yeah. Okay. So that's, that's the message that everyone should take away yes. from this interview. But, and that the game um, is amazing. It's about two <laughs> friends who die and go to hell and have to drink their way out of hell, like we're doing right now. <laughs> Wait, this is hell? We're in hell, no, no, we're no, dead? No, no. Oh no, <laughs> I've made some terrible choices along the way. Um, but yeah, what, what are you hoping the gamers take away from After Party? What is, what is your hope there? I think at the highest level, just that they laugh, because <laughs> it's a very different game than what Oxenfree was. Yeah. Like we, we set out to make this game to feel more like a lean back watch Rick and Morty or uh, you know Bojack Horseman with your friends on the couch, Adult Swim style of thing yeah. on the surface. And then the further you dig and the further you play through it, I think, uh, I guess the next layer after having fun and laughing would be, oh wow, this touched my heart even more than Oxenfree. Uh, there's a lot that we are not really talking about yet in terms of like, the exploration of their friendship and why they're in hell and the nature of all these various people that are there. So I think there's gonna be a lot of surprising stuff in the game. But ultimately just I hope you laugh and have fun in it because it really does like we feel like it feels like an episodic binge worthy series on Netflix or something. If it like a crazy adult animated show. Also who and who doesn't need a good laugh? That's right? it. Everybody now needs for a good sure. Laugh. <laughs> uh, television is mostly like Awesome, but serious dramas and comedy. Have we need, fun. We need, need a Have good fun. laugh. That's what, like, this game is inspired. But like, when we started Oxenfree, it was all the Spielberg stuff. Like I said, this one we were like, how do we make a Bill and Ted? How do we make a Beetlejuice? <laughs> what do you think of this? How do we make the Edgar Wright movies? <laughs> You know, how do we, like that type of a vibe. And that, that's, you know, we just, we don't, there's a lot of those movies, but there's not a lot of those games. So we kind of wanted to make a playable version of that. Sean Crankel, the co-founder of Night School Studios. October 29th is the day you need to go on your platform of choice, except for Switch, because that'll come soon a little later, soonish. Soon yes. But uh, j jump on, play After Party, buy it for 20 bucks. If you're on Xbox and you get a Game Pass subscription, you can just download it and have fun. Sean, thank you so much. Thank this you. This was a blast. Thanks for I being uh, my first guest at the at the bar arcade yeah, slash man. slash whatever I'm allowed to say or I'll not clean say. Clean up now. Trademark. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, we did okay. I think we did good. It was I fun. I agree, I agree. Uh, for more from the best, brightest, and most interesting minds in the games industry, check back every month for new episodes of IGN Unfiltered.